Good afternoon. My name is David Goldenberg, and I'm the ADL Midwest Regional Director. Thank you so much for joining more than 1,400 others from around the country and tuning in for today's conversation. It is a thrill to partner with the Big Ten Conference and Big Ten Network to bring you this very and important conversation on fighting hate and bigotry on college campuses and beyond. Our sincere thanks to Big Ten Commissioner Kevin Warren, your team, and the panelists who we'll be introducing in just a moment, and the team at BTN for your partnership and commitment. Now, personally, as a proud graduate of Michigan State University, I wanna say how wonderful it is to have representatives on the panel from the second and third best school in the conference. <laughs> now I'd like to give a special shout out to Nora Davis in the commissioner's office for being our go-to person in the commissioner's office and in the Big Ten. And also to Dave Revson, the lead anchor here at the Big Ten Network for serving as our moderator and for connecting ADL and the Big Ten. I also wanna congratulate my colleague, Matt Feldman, whose innovative and illustrious mind bore today's discussion. Lastly, I want to thank our good friends at Jones Day Law, at Law Firm for their support of today's program. ADL is the leading anti-hate organization in the country. And since our founding in 1913, ADL's mission has remained unchanged, to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to ensure justice and fair treatment for all. We are a global leader in delivering anti-bias education, in tracking, exposing, and disrupting extremists, and fighting hate online. Over the past 18 months, we've seen a steady uptick in incidents of hate. Asian Americans scapegoated for the spread of COVID. Black and brown Americans remain victims of police violence at alarming rates. Attacks against Jewish Americans increased by 71% during the recent crisis in Israel and Gaza. And Muslims remain victims of acts of Islamophobia and xenophobia. Tragically, no historically marginalized community is safe today. Perhaps most troublesome, and what brings us here together today, is what we're seeing in schools. Hate is seeping down into K through 12 schools and poisoning college campuses and universities. ADL and the Big Ten are coming together today because we cannot sit idly by and let hate take the field. We must speak out so that hate doesn't escalate. We must share facts to combat fear with knowledge, and we must show strength when any community is targeted and attacked. To that end, I'm excited to hear more today about the great work underway by the Big Ten's Equality Coalition and ADL's Hate Uncycled, our anti-bias program on college campuses. It is an honor to partner with the Big Ten and the Big Ten Network today. And with that, I'm pleased to turn it over to our moderator, Dave Revson. Thanks, David. Uh, really well said. I'm honored to be a part of this important discussion and as well to serve on Commissioner Warren's Equality Coalition. Uh, I'm guessing that many listening today have felt the sting of hate at some point in their life. I, I, one of my most vivid memories is being eight or nine years old and being asked by some boys in the neighborhood to come out and, and play football on the street with them, some of the older boys. And we were setting up the football field, and one of them said, well, we'll use the damn Jews driveway as one of the end zones. And just kind of being astonished and, and not knowing what to say. I, I think we've long struggled with difference in our society. And what has happened, unfortunately, is our inability to deal with difference has led to a lot of hate of marginalized groups. And, and it's Somewhat stunning to me that we're sitting here in 2021 and we are still having this conversation. But I think the one thing that I will say that's positive is that I think now more than ever, people are standing up to it and people are saying, we're not gonna have this anymore. This is not okay. Uh, and so I'm hoping that there will be a lot of positive that will come out of this too. I, I was saying this to Nas a little while ago. I really believe that this is the generation that's mm -hmm. gonna change things. I think these young people are empowered. I think they understand that it's wrong and that these are the voices that, that we need to follow. So I'm honored to introduce our panel. Uh, I will start with Nas Hillman. Uh, Nas is one of the great young voices around some of these issues. She is an All-American basketball player at the University of Michigan. She was Big Ten Women's Player of the Year last year, but has also used this time uh, and her platform to 
really rally around some of these important causes. And, and so I commend her uh, on that. And you'll uh, get a lot out of listening to her here today. Uh, Dr. Lara Trubowitz is the education director at the ADL Midwest. She's also the associate director of national college and university programs. Uh, Kevin Warren, obviously a familiar face to many in his second year as the commissioner of the Big Ten. Kevin is the first African-American commissioner of a Power Five conference mm -hmm. and came to the Big Ten after serving as the chief operating officer of the Minnesota Vikings. Karen Dennis is the longtime track and field coach and cross country coach at Ohio State University. She was the women's track coach for the US Olympic team in 2000 mm -hmm. in the Sydney Olympics and is also a 10 time <laughs> Big Ten coach of the year. That's pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> Just 10. Uh, again, I'm Dave Rosen, the lead studio host of the Big Ten Network. I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what we're going to be doing here in terms of the format. We will have a conversation uh, amongst this group for the next 30 or 35 minutes. During the course of this conversation, I'm sure all of you have been on Zoom. If you have a question that you want to ask of anyone on the panel, just submit it in the chat. And then when we get to the end of our conversation, that's the way that we will take questions from the audience. Obviously, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we'll have somebody monitoring that chat and bring a representative group of questions uh, to our panel at the end. So with no further ado, let's get to it. Laura, I want to start with you because I think before you can discuss a problem, you need to define the problem. So uh, give us a sense of what you are monitoring in ADL in terms of What's happening? What's on your radar? What's going on on college campuses? Sure. Well, as many of you know, ADL tracks anti-Semitic incidences across the country. What we've seen since 2016 is a 59% increase in reported anti-Semitic incidents. And that's reported, so we know that those numbers are actually higher. Uh, in the Midwest alone, since 2016, we've had a 55% increase in the K-12 space. So that's particularly concerning for us. We also track white supremacist propaganda incidents. Again, these are reported incidents uh, across the country. Since 2018, we've seen a 76% increase in white supremacist propaganda incidents. Um, now, that's the stuff that gets into the news. Those are the extreme incidents. We're also very closely following the more quotidian or everyday behaviors that are bias-based, um, the kind of stuff that makes it more difficult for our classrooms, our communities, our college campuses to have an inclusive environment, a welcoming environment for all. Um, let me spend a few moments when you're talking about identifying the problem, talking about the kind of incident that we're seeing on college and university campuses. One of the most recent incidences was at Vanderbilt. There was a uh, baseball World Series men's baseball uh, event, and a group of spectators started hurling racial slurs at the families of the student athletes. Uh, not too long ago, it's about a year back now, a gymnast, African-American gymnast in Alabama was uh, raising concerns about the use of the N-word by her teammates and by her coaches. So this is one of the things that we want to pay attention to is the fact that we're not just having incidents come from fans to fans or player to player, but also within the coaching staff, which is of concern to us. So this player raised concerns about the use of the N-word and the joke, what she, jokes and what she was told was, oh, you're being too serious. It's not really a problem. We're also seeing incidents in the high school space. Not too long ago, we had in Ohio um, an incident where a student athlete, due to an injury, didn't, wasn't able to make practice. The coaches, as punishment, made this student eat a pepperoni pizza. Now, this student identifies as a Hebrew Israelite, so doesn't eat pork as part of his religious beliefs. So that's the kind of stuff that we are seeing on a regular basis, and I want to emphasize that. This stuff is not out of the ordinary. It is has happened for a long, long time. What we now have is the ability to think about our strategies and tools for addressing these kinds of incidents in the contemporary era. Commissioner Warren, with that as a backdrop and an uncomfortable backdrop, I think, for everyone listening in, in a lot of different ways, give us some insight into why you started the Equality Coalition and what you hope to achieve with it. I mean, the main reason is uh, to recognize that you know, this is not a job. I didn't come here for a job. Uh, I came here for an opportunity uh, for a platform uh, to encourage 
individuals like on this panel, but to encourage talented young student athletes like Nas and many others uh, who are incredible athletes, but more so incredible students, but even more so who are incredible people. Mm -hmm. And they needed the support, uh, the empowerment to say it's okay uh, to be able to, to come forward. Um, all of these issues, do they surprise me? Not at all. As I have a saying, you know, that I say to many people, I've been black my whole life. And uh, so it's not something that's new uh, to me. And probably the only place that color is not seen is when uh, I'm in my house. Um, but I know when I step outside of my house or our apartment here in Chicago, I'm a black man. And I recognize that. But instead of running from it, I just want to create an atmosphere where we're comfortable to talk about these issues, uh, to act upon these issues, uh, and to do something about these issues. Because uh, one of the good things about it, I'm one of those people that always looks for the positive, you know, energy. And and unfortunately, you know, being from Minneapolis for the last 15 years of my life, uh, when George Floyd was murdered. But one good thing about 2020, we lost a lot of people's lives with COVID. George Floyd and a whole list of other people, Armand Aubrey, and I mean, I was there when Philando Castile was, was shot and um, all those different things that happened. But the biggest thing is that when those negative things have happened in society, my whole goal is for us at the Big Ten to take those learnings, but to move forward and create a platform to make the world a better place. And it's individuals like Naz, I love watching her play as a former basketball student athlete, but I just really love the energy from her heart. And I say it all the time, she's heard me say it, you know, if she wants to be president of the United States one day, she will be. And, uh, and I just want her that when she's sworn in as president of the United States, that she can, <laughs> and I say this seriously, that she will say that the Big Ten afforded her a platform to be able to be encouraged. And she can do anything she wants to do. Doctor, lawyer, school teacher, broadcaster, president of the US, coach, astronaut. And I just want her to know that. And so many of her peers around the league that she knows that we're doing everything on a daily basis to encourage them to be great. Yeah, it's such a positive message. And I, I think I want to use that as a jumping off point. I'm interested from you, Nas, and from Coach Dennis as well. And, and Nas, we can start with you. I mean, with, with you, you know, heading to the White House, I mean, people are, are, are eager to hear from you next year. But um, what when you join the Equality Coalition, the, one of the things that's really struck me is we're doing things. We're, we're trying to, to make things better, right? Whether, whatever it is, we've all kind of, not to get too inside baseball, we're on different subcommittees and, and we're trying to move forward here. What was it that, that attracted you to it and what did you hope to achieve with the Equality Coalition? Mm -hmm. I mean, over this past year, Commissioner Warren just talked about it. A lot of eyes were open. Um, I got to sit in front of the TV and watch a lot of news and see what was going on in our world. And I felt like during those moments, I finally found my voice to speak, not just you know with my friends and family, but with my teammates and whoever would listen. Um, being a student athlete, you have such a huge platform, whether that's social media, your interviews, an event like this. Um, and I just, I understood that people would listen. Um, and for the first time, you know, I use my voice and I want to be a part of something bigger than, than basketball, than sports. And I feel like that's exactly what the Equality Coalition is doing. Um, as an athlete, I feel like you always look for a team. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it really is a team fighting against racism and inequality on, on so many levels and bringing together so many backgrounds, schools, universities, people in general uh, for, for a greater cause. And, and that was a, a huge thing for me because, you know, I, I didn't know if I could do it by myself, just talking, you know, with my teammates and the coalition brought so much information for me to bring back to my family and to my teammates, for people who didn't know that was, that was a big, big thing this year. I didn't know. I didn't understand. Um, and I felt like the coalition would do that for me. And, it, and it's done just that during this, um, you know, 18 months or so that we've kind of gone through this, this up and down of inequality and, and being on the coalition. So it was, it was just to be a part of something that was bigger than me, um, bigger than myself and, and trying to find a way to make change uh, in the smallest way. But I don't think that the, quali uh, the coalition has been in the smallest way because uh, we continue to talk about you know, these situations and circumstances. And I think you know, that's the, the biggest thing of, is, is to continue the conversation. Uh, because if we let the media not talk about it anymore, and then we stop talk, talking about it, we won't continue to move forward in this process. So just, you know, I felt like it was something that not every other conference do, does or, or did. Uh, and it was something different and special. 
and I, and I want to be a part of it. And one of the things that's been really neat for me, and now we're going into year 15 of the Big Ten Network, is we just finished our camp tours. And at each one of these camp tours for football, we get to speak with student athletes. And I'm just unendingly blown away by the student athletes in this league. And, and Commissioner, I remember we were on one of the early quality coalition calls and you texted me in the middle of the call and you said, these student athletes are amazing. They're going to change the world. And they, they are going to change the world. And, and this is one who's going to change it next to us. So anxious to see where your journey takes you. We'll, we'll hear more from Nas in a moment, but, but Coach Dennis, I'm interested in, from your point of view, working with student athletes every day, why did you feel it was important to join the coalition and what do you hope to get out of it? Well, my family uh, history plays a major role as, as to why I wanted to be on this coalition and I appreciate the opportunity. Um, my grandfather was an American Native, uh, Native American Indian. My grandmother was a, a descendant of slaves. My um, family uh, migrated from um, Georgia because of racial, racial tension in Georgia. So they migrated north to Michigan. And um, my mother, who is uh, a, a school teacher by profession, and my father, um, you know, is from a family of 13 kids. And they always were active in uh, the NAACP. They always joined social uh, organizations that uplifted uh, Black people and politics, education, and um, music was part of our culture. And I felt that it was important to pass that on. I have to carry on with the pride and the purpose, purposeful practice of uplifting uh, my race. And so I felt an honor to be on this, on this coalition. And like Commissioner Warren, he felt like, you know, he says he's not, he wasn't here for a job. I'm not just a coach. Mm -hmm. And our student athletes are not just jocks and jockettes. Mm -hmm. They are very learned young people who are uh, interested in making sure the world is a better place. And I think it's important that as, as minorities, sometimes we don't have a voice to talk about our journeys, to talk about our experiences. And I think the only way that we're gonna come together collectively and create a more harmonious society is we have to share ideas, we have to share experiences, and we have to share knowledge. And that's why I think um, this coalition is perfect. The platform that um, uh, Commissioner Warren has set up that enables us to have a safe space to be able to talk about not just the problems, but potential solutions to the problems, because that's what knowledge and practice is about. You know, we heard Laura kind of set the table for us in a disturbing way, to say mm -hmm. the least, of, of what's going on on campus right now. I'm interested from the two of you who spend every day on campus, what, what's your feeling on the climate on, on campus right now in terms of, of hate? Um, there's a big question mark, I think. Our students, um, they grew up with a black president. You know, Barack Obama was the president. And for them to experience the kind of um, trauma that we're experiencing right now is, is uns unsettling and, and they don't know why. And I think that if we don't give them some answers regarding the historical um, significance and, and, and um, lineage of racism, then they're not going to have the answers. So I, I feel like um, I'm seeing that our students, they're traumatized because it's their friends and their brothers and their cousins, their relatives who are dying and who are suffering. And at the same time, there's, a, there's, there's hope because they're young and they're resilient and they know that it's not gonna be this way when they grow up because they know that they have the power to change things. So I see it's, it's a paradox, you know, there, there's hope and there's also despair, but at the same time, there's courage and resilience and um, they're tough. They are tough. I mean, you think about everything they've been through in terms of the issues we're talking about. And then, oh, by the way, you put this pandemic on top of it, which has thrown exactly. all of their lives into incredible turmoil at, at a really young age. It, it's, it's an age group that is to be commended right now. Nas, I'm curious what you're sensing on campus. I think Coach hit the, the nail on the head with that one is there is a lot of despair and, and, and a lot of times it's discouraging to mm. wake up and see on the news every day or almost every day for for a long time some type of yeah. 
police brutality or some type of inequality or the wide range of, you know, what Laura talked about a little bit. Um, but, you know, through all of it, I feel like we have come together and say, this isn't going to continue. Mm -hmm. And I feel like for a lot of the time, people are saying it's getting better. And it is in some regards, but at the same time, is it getting better or are we, are we shifting our minds and our attention to something else? Mm -hmm. um, and I think in, in this generation, a lot of, or we've had a ton of conversations of, of changing it so that it's not just, it, it seems better for now, but it'll be better for everyone to come after us. Um, and, and I feel like a huge part of why I'm a part of this coalition and why I want it to be is because it may not necessarily change for me right now. And I'm only, I'm in my last year of college, but looking you know, for those girls or, or boys coming after me so that it'll change for them. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the biggest thing here is, is that there, there's people willing to change, um, look for change, strive for change and be, and be a part of it, uh, not just for now, but, but in many years to come. Laura, I know ADL has a program that is specifically to fight hate on campus called Hate Uncycled. Mm -hmm. Give us some insight into that kind of, you know, piggybacking here a little bit off of what Coach Dennis and Nas are talking about. Yeah, sure. So the work that we do, Hate Uncycled, is a comprehensive program designed to equip all members of the college or university community to combat hate. It's really about skill set development. We know that um, you can tell people, hey, be kind to one another. You can tell people stand up for one another. But if you're not giving people the skill sets to do that or talking about what that feels like, what that looks like, even what risks may be involved, then you're really, to some extent, setting yourself up for one, only short-term solutions, and you're setting people up to fail. So what we do with Hate Uncycled is we work with communities, again, that's faculty, chancellors, uh, presidents of universities, new students, uh, staff, campus safety teams to develop the skills to combat bias and hate. We cover a lot of different topics. So that's for instance, free speech, the relationship between free speech and hate speech, uh, mm -hmm. online cyber harassment and bullying. We uh, look at le higher ed legislation specifically around civil rights. We have uh, lessons and modules designed to help people think about white supremacist recruitment tactics. We have anti-bias training. We have crisis response and readiness uh, training. Mm -hmm. Everything that we do is based on five guiding principles, and that is prepare. So you're always preparing for incidents. We know that they will unfortunately happen. Uh, prevent, you're setting up strategies and tools for preventing them when possible. You are responding, so you're having an apparatus in place to respond to bias and hate incidents. You are working on healing and then on educating the community. The idea is to carefully link what we would call inclusion efforts with bias incident response efforts. And we know that when we respond, um, when we develop our inclusion efforts in, in a way that encompasses or brings together everybody in the campus community, we will be better set up to reduce the number of incidents that occur. And when we respond well to incidents, we are strengthening our inclusion efforts. The idea here is also to level set vocabulary so that an incoming student on campus for the first time can go to the chancellor of the university and have a conversation mm -hmm. about say free speech using the same vocabulary. So they're on the same page, they have a shared knowledge base. We believe that that's absolutely essential to create a shared vocabulary, um, a shared passion across the campus community. One of the things uh, that I get to do that is a great privilege is I get to work with teams, uh, train them, talk to them. I had one wonderful experience where a, a team guided by the coach brought me in to talk to the players about the N-word that was being passed around from player to player and team to team. And, and one of the conversations we had is what do you do if an opposing team used the N-word as you were playing? So the players said, well, we, that's a brawl, right? We're on the field, we're fighting it out. The coaches were like, whoa, wait a second. That's not something you can do. That's gonna get us suspended. We're not gonna be able to play again. So they had an incredibly productive conversation about what do you do when passions spiral? The first thing on our tongues, unfortunately, are those racial slurs. We use them, um, they're instigated by those passions. How do we solve this problem? Um, 
they had a great conversation. So I think that's one of the things that is so crucial and that Hate Uncycled helps people do is normalize the conversations that we have to have on a daily basis. One of the things I think has been great about the Equality Coalition and, and really this, as horrible as this last 18 months has been, one of the things, the one positive that I think has come out of it is dialogue, is what you're talking about, that, that people have spoken. And so I think I'm interested from, from the three of you who are involved in athletics, you think about a college campus and for whatever reason, the most visible thing going on on a college campus is athletics. I mean, that's just the way it is. You can say whether it's right, wrong, indifferent. That's the truth. It's the front porch of the university. So what is the role that each of you believe? And Commissioner Warren, I, I can start with you. What is the role that you believe athletics can play on a college campus in this problem and in perhaps a solution? I think it's a it's a critical role because it uh, allows people to to have cover, uh, to be comfortable. I mean, one of the great things about you know sports, it truly is a meritocracy, uh, and all you have to do is 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 when you see a a big play and a score or you know incredible basket or a touchdown or whatever the case may be to see the crowds come together. I think it shows that you know sports is one of those things where sometimes it transcends race. And the thing that we need to keep in mind is we need to carry that same energy together that we have when we're cheering for our favorite teams in the Big Ten. But we need to carry that into life to be supportive. And so I think, um, and one good thing being a former student athlete is nothing like being on a team. And even in the preseason and the, during the season and the struggles that you really go through uh, to work through it. And, and I think that's why sports is just such a critical you know, component uh, that you have to recognize that at the end of the day, uh, that we're all the same. If you if you split us all open, our organs and all the things, we look the same. Um, and so if, if you, Dave, if you split me open and split you open and someone came in, did an autopsy, our, our organs, you know, inside, we, we would- Let's not know, do that anytime. No, no. I, 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 the reason why I say that is that you can't say that, yeah. okay, that, that, that color, you know, this an outward, right. um, you know, stance on it. So I think we need to be mindful that to recognize the power of sport. Yep. And the power of uh, of our voice, and like Nas uh, has said, is she has an incredible platform. That's why every time I watch her play, you know, she even sends messages in her body language uh, to be positive. And this is what we need to do: is make sure we encourage this generation, because I am so hopeful that they will change the world and they'll get us back to where uh, we need to get uh, to. Uh, we've lost our way at certain times in the country, but I just have such great faith, not only in our country, in the world, but in people, but especially our young people. Now, as, as you look at yourself as a student athlete, and again, in this very visible role with an enormous platform, what is the role that you see athletics playing in what we're talking about in achieving some of these goals? Again, it's, it's playing a huge role because of that platform and being able to, to speak my mind and, and have people listen from all different walks of life, from so many different ages, we're talking through K through, K through 12, and those are a main group of people who come to our basketball games. Um, and, just, and just speaking out about it, knowing that your voice will be heard. Uh, and, and people don't necessarily stop watching sports, you know? Mm -hmm. As all year round, people wanna see the, the basket, the touchdown, and everything in between. And if you interject, in some ways, those those beliefs of you know coming together for something bigger than your sport, uh, like we're talking about now, and and taking that not just on the court or the field, but into your everyday life and into into your locker rooms or into your families, uh, it spreads it spreads quicker. Um, their strength in numbers, and we've seen that time and time again, whether that's in sports, whether that's everyday life, um, whether it's the coalition. Um, just the, the powerful numbers that we've had on there. Um, it's just, it's, it just shows how much, you know, sports kind of rolls into our everyday life because people love to watch it and they won't stop watching it. And if you could, you know, put your voice out there and, and your knowledge out there, somebody's going to pick it up and, and roll with it as well. Um, and, and that's kind of how you get that ball rolling. Coach Janice, I, I mentioned that you had the role with the U.S. Olympic team. And so you've seen this not just from a, a college campus point of view, but from an international point of view on a global scale, because, you know, let's be honest here, I and mean, we're talking about ADL in the Midwest, but this, this is a national issue. This is an international issue. This is something the entire world is confronting, hate and how to handle difference. What role do you see sport playing more globally? 
you know, I look, I think about um, Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles and the backlash that they received um, for wanting to protect their mental health, wanting to protect their well being, wanting to protect their bodies. And I think if they were not black and brown people, then they would not have gotten that kind of backlash. But because they were, I really think that they made a tremendous, their voices um, was amplified throughout the universe that we are not just jockets. We are human beings, we have feelings, we have uh, intelligence, and we have a role not only just to our team, but also to ourselves. Uh, one of the things I think is, is happening is that um, as, as student athletes play together, as, coach, as a coach, I can't forget that they're also people and they're in society and they are bombarded with a lot of negative and external stimuli. And it's one, I could just say, hey, let's, let's play you know, shut up and dribble. But that's not, that's not the appropriate response. If we're serious about nurturing, um, not just our teams, but our students as people, as human beings, we want them to grow strong, be empowered, have courage to be able to feel comfortable to say what you want to say, Nas. And as a coach, I feel like that's my role. It's not just to make sure we gonna win, we, you know, we do want to win, but at the same time, you know, I want to win with integrity and I want to win with students who can win themselves personally. And that's important. Kevin, who helped you find your voice? Uh, my parents. I mean, I had a, you know, interesting background um, and I remind people all the time. I did grow up how we live now. And mm -hmm. so if you look on my mother's side, my grandmother's uh, uh, a Mexican American who was born in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico, who snuck across the border, who met my grandfather, who was a soldier at Fort Huachuca, uh, who in my, when my mom was an eighth grader left home and never came back. So I never have, I don't know my grandfather. Uh, so I spent many of my weekends in the Mexican projects in Phoenix in the summer. That's where my grandmother lived. And then on my father's side, uh, my grandmother is uh, uh, part Indian, part black. Um, and my grandfather is a black man. Uh, none of them uh, graduated from college. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather uh, had a dispute with a white male in, in Texas because he said something to my grandmother. And because uh, people always ask, how did the Warrens get to Phoenix? And, and I said, they, we weren't moving to Phoenix. We were leaving Texas. Yeah. And, uh, and there's a difference. And that's yeah. how we landed there. Yeah. And then the other big data point for me is uh, we lived in an enclave in Phoenix called South Phoenix, all 100% Black, but directly across the street, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that was, that was his house because mm -hmm. he's from Chicago, had emphysema, he built the home. And it really hit me because when I was watching a uh, story on Malcolm X uh, earlier this year, our address was 2131 East Valley Drive, and they were right across the street from us. And, uh, and you figure I was born in 63. So in the 60s, between the murder of Dr. King and Malcolm X and all the different issues and I remember as a kid, I was probably six or seven years old. I asked my mom, why don't they have all their meetings up and down our street? Because they would walk up and down our street all day with security guards. Mm -hmm. I said, boy, they're in good shape. She, <laughs> said, she said, no, their house is bugged. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, so to see and have interaction with Elijah Muhammad and learn about Malcolm X and, mm -hmm. and uh, Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy and John Kennedy and you know, Herbert Hoover. And I mean, I mean, all of these different things to recognize kind of from whence we've come and then knowing about, you know, my heritage and lineage mm -hmm. and gr grandmother was a maid. And so going to mm -hmm. clean houses, you know, with her in Paradise Valley and certain issues that people said to her and to me, you know, growing, you know, growing up as I just have never forgotten that a lot of it, I'll take to, to my grave. Mm -hmm. So I think the fact of the matter is by having these opportunities to talk about that, we can share our stories. Uh, not to brag, but just to say that we're all, you know, have interesting, you know, backgrounds, but, and that's why being on a college campus is so special. And I'm a big believer. Yeah. You learn a lot in the classroom. You learn a lot being an athlete, 
but you also learn a lot just by the interaction and field trips and the experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I feel I have a fiduciary responsibility as commissioner that when our student athletes graduate, they don't just graduate with a diploma, but they graduate with a lot of life lessons. And what other conference do you have, chancellors and presidents, coaches, athletic directors, commissioners, administrators, student athletes, all coming together for a common goal. And that's what makes the Big Ten the Big Ten. And that's why it's not a number, it's a brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such an amazing time in your life. And you're right. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if we were presented with the final exams for some of our classes right now. <laughs> Any of us would do all that well, but there are other lessons that you learned in your time there that, that resonate and that sure. inform the rest of, of your life. Now, as everyone else has told their backstory, give us a little bit of, of yours and how you arrived at Michigan. Uh, yeah, so in terms of, I kind of want to talk about how I kind of found my voice yeah. um, in all of this. Uh, my parents, 100%. Uh, I, in some regards, I would say I was a little sheltered growing up, but they definitely always took the time to sit me down and have those uncomfortable conversations that we kind of have uh, today. And I used to hate it. I'd just be like, I don't want to talk about this. Like, why are you asking me these questions? I would rather like go study or go play basketball was in or, something, or something along the lines right, besides, right. you know, having this super uncom uncomfortable conversation, but it was throughout my entire life. And I never understood why they actually hated it. Like I, like I just said, and then through all of this, just kind of found that voice and, and kind of thought back to, wow, this is why I had those uncomfortable conversations with my parents. So now I can have them with my teammates and my friends and whoever in between wants to have them. Um, and then I would say that coach and Commissioner Warren helped me amplify my voice um, and, and really backing me throughout this entire process. Uh, one of our first uh, equality uh, meetings, uh, Commissioner Warren at the end of it was like, Nas, do you have anything to say? <laughs> and I'm just like, well, good thing I was prepared to say something. <laughs> you know, I could have, you know, been doing anything in between. Um, but him kind of having that courage and faith in me to say she's got something important to say mm -hmm. made me feel like, okay, people are listening. The commissioner <laughs> is listening. Um, so other people will listen and, and I can spew my voice or whatever I have to say through that. And, and coach has also been a huge part of that and helped me get to get on the coalition originally. And we've had tons of conversations uh, in between of how, how our team can be better mm -hmm. um, and how you know we can't just sit there and just talk about basketball or you, we, we need to go right. to some of these meetings about equality or, or, you know, anything in between. So just those, those people for people um, really helped me to, to find my voice and then amplify it. And, and that's just, you know, been the, the strongest story for me uh, in this past year, really, that yeah. I've, that I've really found it and amplified my voice. Well said. Uh, we have a few minutes here before we get to the Q and A. So I want to leave this part of our conversation with this, and I'm interested in, in hearing from each one of you and, and maybe now we can start with you and, and we'll work our way down. How will we know when we've made progress? It's a great question. Uh, I think that we'll never know it in the moment. I think that after a, a while, we'll see and look back and say, wow, we, we were a part of that. We are the people who got the ball rolling. And I really feel like that's what the Equality Coalition is doing, uh, kind of going out there, finding people, bringing them together. So that down the line, we'll say, you know, we made that happen or we helped to make that happen. And one example of that is, I would say, with our voter registration, that was a huge part in our Equality Coalition and a huge point of emphasis throughout this uh, last election period. And I learned a lot. I was kind of one of those people who uh, the election is for the presidents. Like, those are the elections that we really need to worry about. But no, you have them in your in your county, in your city, in your state, and that they're just as important as the presidential elections. And in that moment, did I feel like we were making a huge a push in some ways, but not until we found out how many people were registered who had not been registered prior to, how many absentee ballots were sent out, how many people actually went out and helped to uh, to be at the ballots and, and helped to um, get people re registered. And, and that was huge and eye-opening for me because it was one of the first things I feel like the Equality Coalition did. Um, and in the moment, it seemed like a lot. And it seemed like, you know, are, are we going in the right direction? Uh, of course, I felt like we were going in the right direction, but is, are, is everyone following? Um, and then I didn't, and you saw it at the end, the, the, the numbers and the production uh, that we kind of had. So there's going to be a little bit of a, of a, a blanket where you don't know that there's, there's uh, movement until you look back and, and you really sit back and think about it. Laura? 
when we no longer um, treat incidents as an opportunity for crisis management, that we're really thinking about the work that we have to do every day to prevent incidents from occurring. Um, I think somebody who spends a lot of time working with biases and response teams at universities and colleges, I also think about seeing, and this is gonna sound counterintuitive, seeing an uptick in reports of incidents. So we, we eliminate some of the fear and the shame of reporting that, that surrounds reporting incidents. Um, I love what you're talking about, the big picture stuff, Naz. How do we change culture, right, at large? I also think that there are ways in which we can talk about the stuff, the practices that we engage in on a daily basis that um, may be detrimental to our well-being on colleges, uh, college and university campuses. For instance, trash talk, right? That's actually a space where we see a lot of this, the slurs going back and forth because it's a normal part of our, our athletic banter. So let's spend a little time talking about trash talk. And I think when we start having conversations about what we do every day to either increase inclusion and decrease incidents, that's gonna be an important uh, change. I think name what's going on, that again, we become comfortable naming what we're seeing, naming the hate uh, so that we don't let it pass us by. I think athletics gives us an extraordinary opportunity to talk about this stuff because it's a space where people from all different backgrounds, to follow up on what you were saying, are coming together. That can cause tension, but wow, also what an opportunity uh, to engage in across our differences in really wonderful ways. And I think know our history. Um, just everyone's talking a little bit about their background. My, my dad was a college basketball player for CCNY in the 1940s. And his team was, it was an immigrant team and a team made up of Jews and blacks. That was their team. And he talks about going uh, to places in the South where the opposing teams wouldn't shake their hands. So this stuff has again been going on for a long time and we got to know our history. I think we also have an opportunity to look at our research. And here I'm speaking as a historian. There have been some incredible studies where say we look at broadcasters language and the ways that they describe players activity um, on a field. And what we've noticed is that if the player is darker skinned, then the language changes, mm -hmm. right? So even paying attention to these subtle, subtle things. And I think what I'm optimistic about is we're the developing the tools to look at the macro and the micro, the small and the large, and understand that there's an extraordinary relationship that links them both. Those were great CCNY teams. They were, the indeed. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, that. that was the day. Uh, Commissioner? The day for me, I'll keep it simple, is um, I think you really, my prayer every day is that mm -hmm. we as adults hopefully get to the point when you go to a, a birthday party for one-year-olds, mm -hmm. Now that tells us all that we need to know. I mean, you go, that's the thing I love. You watch them. I mean, they don't know about color. I mean, they don't even know about gender. You know, they just treat we, each other. They're having fun um, and uh, they're interacting with people. And it's interesting about life because somewhere from that birthday party at one year old till high school and college and now some of our older people is that we, we these are all learned behaviors. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there's so many, subtleties that in society and those are things I always I always major in the minors mm -hmm. but the little things you know why in pool that if you hit the black ball and you lose <laughs> you know why is it bad if a, mm -hmm. they say a black cat run across your your car you know that's something bad or blacklisted you know words matter and so so many times the words that we use on a daily basis we don't even know that we're basically facilitating and carry on you know this viewpoint that 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 color does matter and we say it in our words, we don't even really, you know, really recognize uh, what we're what we're saying or doing. And so I'm very cognizant and conscientious of color and words and structure and schemes, and then to do all that we can to to try to to correct those because it's never too late. And so that that's what gives me hope about the the future is that we're at least this last year. What it allowed us to do is talk about things that we all been talking about. Now let's talk about the talk. I had to talk with my kids. My parents had to talk with me. Um, but now those conversations that we used to have in our church or on the back porch or the kitchen table, now we're able to have um, on today like today. And that's why I'm so grateful for, for ADL. And I think the more that we can converse and come together, we'll be able to turn it around. And, uh, and then we won't have many firsts. I look forward to the day when I'm not the, you know, first. Mm -hmm. um, right. um, and, and, um, but we have a, you know, we have a long way to go and this will not be solved in this generational. 
uh, generation. This would be a multi-generational issue, but I'm confident just in my belief of people that we'll, we'll get to where we need to get to mm-hmm. as a people. Coach Dennis? Now, as we had Black Power Hour mm-hmm. with my coach, and uh, he's 92 years old right now. Um, but we had those conversations, those uh, uncomfortable conversations that, yeah, we want to get out and go outside and, and at least do something else. But I, what gives, uh, I think when we, when I, I don't know when we get there is um, when we can, combination of what everybody said, we have, we've got to not be afraid to educate our young people about the history of this country. Mm-hmm. If we don't do that, if we continue to fail and be afraid that the authentic history of slavery and um, uh, racism, systemic racism, as long as that's sanitized, we are not going to make it. I really feel it's important that as coaches, as athletes, and we share as commissioner, he shared his experience. So this is the micro way that we can talk about our our histories. Um, Sure, equality is fine. I think we'll get there. I don't know we're there when we have equity. Mm -hmm. When we know that everybody has everything they need in order to thrive. Mm -hmm. That's when I know we're there. And Dave, I'm so grateful for my parents. My father was in World War II and he talked to us as much about uh, the Holocaust mm. as he did slavery. I mean, he was there when in Auschwitz. And so for him to come and, and tell those stories, he brought pictures um, and he would show us, you know, my dad was a kind of unvarnished Ooh. person, but, you know, I was able to show my friends uh, about the concentration camp. So he would always tell me that, you know, never, never let this happen again. Mm-hmm. Never let slavery happen again. Mm-hmm. Never let the Holocaust happen again. Um, and uh, And that's something that has always you know, stuck, you know, with me. So all the way from Victor Frankl, I mean, he, these are the books that we would read yep. um, uh, as much as Langston Hughes. Yes. So he would, he would, I, I just am so grateful for my mother and father that they, you know, had unvarnished conversations about Emmett Till, everything with us, but they told us, you know, never let uh, these atrocities ever happen again, as long as you can. Really well said. And hopefully we did a little something today to, to move toward that goal. Again, as I mentioned, we're not done with our program. We wanted to open it up now to the people who have been watching and listening. And so thanks to the panelists, but you'll hear more from them. Uh, But to guide us through that is Matt Feldman from ADL Midwest. Hello, everyone. Uh, Thank you for the robust conversation so far. We could easily have another hour with three dozen questions that have come in so far. We'll have time for three. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm going to send a follow-up survey to our panelists. We'll take three hours to fill it out for you all. Um, given this is a conversation about looking at um, hate on campus through the lens of coll- collegiate athletics, a really poignant question came through. I'll read it verbatim. How can the need for cooperation in general be emphasized in an arena of competition? Hmm. It's a really thought-provoking question to anybody on the panel. How would you address that one? Coach? I want to hear the question again. Yeah. Matt, can you repeat you, it? You want to repeat it there, Matt? Yeah. Can you all hear me? No. Um, how can the need for cooperation be emphasized in an arena of competition? So, so in other words, we're working toward a common goal okay. here. Okay. And yet there's a competitive environment. That's right. That's what athletics is about. You know, you're in an arena, um, in, a, in a competitive um, environment, but there's also a sense of fair play. There's also, there, there are rules that have to be adhered to. And if, if the team is, is united, you know, in wanting to win the competition, if they're fractured outside of the competition, then it's gonna be harder to win. And it's important that everybody, every one body is there for the other bodies. And once you've got everybody, a a cohesive unit that's working together with the same emphasis, same goal to win, um, to beat the competitors, not to thrash them, uh, uh, talk about them, 
you know, let's get it done on the court, on the track, in the field. Um, that's what it's all about. It's, it's, it's normal. That's what we do. You know, that's, that's the environment that we're in. It's competitive and it's supposed to be uh, combative, but it doesn't have to be abusive. It should never be abusive. Well said. Anyone have anything they want to add to that? Or should we move on? Well Matt, 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 you want to move on? Absolutely. There was a series of questions asking about anti-Semitism on campus. Specifically, um, as ADL, we track a lot of that data. There was a considerable uptick in that recently. Perhaps some of you could answer that quickly. What we're seeing on campus as it relates to anti-Semitism. Maybe spend a minute or two on that, if you would. Yeah. Well, I mean, Laura, I, I don't know if you want to start. <laughs> it seems like that's in your wheelhouse. Over to David. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No. Sure. Yeah, David. Yeah. I mean, again, I mean, I, I want to stress again and again that none of the stuff that we're seeing is new, right? And that that holds true for anti-Semitism as much as it holds true for other forms of bias and bigotry. Uh, there are now spaces in which we're able to have, in, in for good, we're able to have conversations about what we're seeing. Um, but there are also stronger and greater platforms for the expression of anti-Semitism, hate. When we get political conflict, the kind of rhetoric that we're seeing that sometimes gets attached to that political conflict can escalate into anti-Semitism in part because that's the language that people are familiar with. Um, it's the go-to, right? And I think what we have to do is uh, recognize the ways in which the go-to rhetoric, anti-Semitic rhetoric, how that's coming into play very, very quickly uh, when we are engaging in conversations about politics. We have to ask ourselves, why is it that we go to that rhetoric? right away. Um, and I think that that's true for all of the kind of rhetorics that we're seeing, uh, whether it's racism, sexism, um, anti-trans uh, rhetorics. Mm -hmm. Why is this language that we have access to so readily available mm -hmm. to us? Um, so I'd say, you know, I'm not sure that what we're seeing is new again. Uh, we're seeing it explode. We have to ask ourselves, can we find a way of engaging productively as human to human with one another about conflict so that it doesn't spiral, as you say, doesn't explode into mm -hmm. something that becomes uh, dangerous, unhealthy, interrupts our learning environments, our academic success, and the well-being, not only of our college campuses, because those are microcosms, mm -hmm. right, but our society as a whole. Maybe you want to add to that, Law? Yeah, I think Lara hit it. I, the one point that I would say is that often you see, in many ways, anti-Semitism sometimes can be the tip of the spear. And so, as Lara said, it seems to be the go-to, the, the whole idea of um, the use of Nazi imagery or Hitler for those who are against you has popped up an awful lot, particularly in the last year. Um, but uh, as far as what we're seeing, I think Lara hit the nail right on the head. Matt? Great, thanks, David. As our last question for the panel, and I know David has some closing remarks, this is to every one of you on the panel. What would you say to a high school junior or senior considering going to college? Um, there's so many more factors that come into play now. So what advice, this sort of ties into your comments about what, what gives you hope. What would you say to a college junior or senior considering going to college in this environment? What advice would you give them or their parents or equally part of the decisions? So I'll go, I'd ask the whole panel actually. One thing, start? yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I would say is keep keep your eyes open and ears open to people who will be there to support you speaking out against things that you just don't feel are right. Mm -hmm. I think for a very long time, so many people haven't spoken out because they don't feel heard or or they don't think that what they have to say matters to anyone other than themselves. And over the past couple of years or months or whatever span of time we want to talk about, people are listening. And it only takes one person to believe in you, to, to get the ball rolling, to, to have some type of change or movement or, or change someone's mind. Uh, I think too often we try to suppress these uncomfortable conversations where people aren't reporting incidents or or college campuses are trying to hush hush the racial slurs being sent at student athletes or or students in general um mm -hmm. so so look out for things like that um you you don't want to go to a university or be around people who don't want to understand and learn from someone else's experiences and i think that the experiences is is, is what has has helped us 
grow as a community, um, you know, so much is because, you know, you, it's someone's first hand, you know, and, and, and it, and it goes a long way because it's not a, a, a fairy tale or, or a make believe. Um, it's something that someone's actually experienced. So just kind of going into that role or, or, or listening or, or hearing of people who will be there to support and, and, and listen to you when you, when you're ready to speak up. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I was going to say a couple of things. One, uh, reach out to groups, clubs, communities that you might not normally reach out to. Like get involved in activities that wouldn't be, again, your go-to space. Um, may make you a little uncomfortable, but I think it's important that we step out of our comfort zones in this day and age. The other thing I think is that uh, to some extent, hate is easy. And what I mean by that is, again, I'll, I'll go back to the idea that it's our go-to rhetoric. It's the stuff that's, that's easily accessible. So when we're hearing this kind of stuff being tossed around, I think it's not a bad idea to figure out with the community, never alone, but with the community, why are these slurs, um, these incidents, why are they being tossed out? What are people trying to say with them that they don't have access to? So how do we talk about, here's the hate, here's the expression. What do we talk, how do we talk about the stuff that's really behind it? Um, so I think that's crucial. What that means, though, is create opportunities for having those conversations. Again, I'll go back to this team that I worked with, where the coaches very intentionally with the players made a space. They actually formed, they had a reading club, talk about your Black Power Club, right? So they had a reading club where they talked about the stuff together. And that was part of the team culture, part of the team environment. So if the opportunities aren't there for you to have these kinds of conversations, work with people to make them. Um, I don't think any individual should stand alone. It's too risky at this point, quite frankly, to stand alone. So we got to find community. We got to find groups to be able to do this work. Dave, I think that um, that we have to recognize that 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 actions do matter. So many times we think we need to be loud and screaming and yelling. We don't have to be. I was just like the former, uh, <clears throat> I mean, the owners of the Minnesota Vikings when they promoted me to be chief operating officer. That was a big. It was a big deal. It said a lot. Uh, you think of Rosa Parks. I never, I've never heard her yell or scream. Uh, she just acted. And so I think we need to recognize that actions matter and encourage young people to feel comfortable to act. Coach? Um, I think being comfortable in your own skin. And I think the community um, Laura talked about is important. Um, a simple phrase I heard all my life from my coach, do the right thing, do your best, always. Mm. Simple, but it's all inclusive. You know, it's interesting. I, I think about, I have a, a college age student, one who's gonna be a sophomore, and then we have uh, twins who will be juniors in high school or just started their junior year in high school. And so I've thought a lot about them making that transition that we're talking about to a a college campus and um i think about when i made it and most of us come from you know a commissioner you were talking about the neighborhood you grew up in and there's a lot of people who are similar to you right and i think that that's kind of unfortunately how our country is there are exceptions there are people who go to diverse high schools and come from diverse areas but that's the exception more than the rule and i think the wonderful thing about college is that for the first time people are exposed mm -hmm to people who come from different backgrounds with different ideas. Mm -hmm. I just hope that young people who go to college will listen. Yeah. I, I think that's like, there's such a, listening is such a skill. Yeah. And and I, I just think it gets lost in all the bluster and wanting yourself to be heard. And, and so I hope that the people have learned something from listening to, to everyone on this panel today. I, I, I really believe there's so much to be glean from that. And so I would hope that, that someone who's heading to a college campus will embrace the difference that they find rather than being threatened by it and see it as an opportunity to, to experience the world through someone else's eyes. David? Well, thanks so much. And thank you, Dave. And thank you, Naz. And thank you, Lara. And thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Coach. Um, thinking and listening to this panel today, it's inspiring, but it also reminds me of a story I once heard 
about a wealthy couple who invited a bunch of college students to their home. They had this beautiful estate and out back there was this beautiful lake and they brought all the students out to the back and they said, listen, everyone, out there in the middle of the lake, there's a rock with a turtle sitting there on the rock and it can't get out because, and it can't get back to shore because there are piranhas and alligators and crocodiles in the lake. And so what I'm gonna offer to one of you is if you can get out there to that rock and get that turtle and bring that turtle back to the shore safely, you can have anything you want. You can have wealth, you can have a job, you can have trips, whatever you want. And so the couple's sitting there and of course the students are looking at one another and no one moves. The couple turns around and walks away and splash. They turn around and there is a student bobbing and weaving back and forth in between the piranhas and alligators, gets to the little rock, stands up, takes a deep breath, bends down, picks up the, the turtle and looks out again, jumps back into the lake, bobbing and weaving again back and forth and gets to the shore. As the student is getting out, breathing heavily, dripping wet, the couple comes running around the corner and they go, that was amazing. What is it that you want? The student looks down, shrugs the shoulders and says, I just want to know who pushed me in the lake. <laughs> <laughs> At ADL, our job is to jump into the lake. Our college students, our universities have become places of lakes where people, not only just on campus, but around the country are being thrown into the lake. And when we think about the type of support that we can provide, the types of conversations we need to have, what we heard today from our panelists are so important. And when I think about it, from the banks of the Red Cedar to old Ohio, <laughs> dear old state to our old IU, our schools and communities are stronger together than ever when we work together and speak out against all forms of hate. And so I wanna thank everybody again for being here. If you wanna learn more about ADL and Hate Uncycled, visit ADL.org. And if you wanna learn more about the Big Ten Conference and the incredible work that the conference is doing with the Equality Commission, visit Big10.org. One thing is for sure that is absolutely clear after today's conversation, as the commissioner said a little while ago, we're just getting started. And so thanks so much for tuning in and have a great day.